Well, welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. Today's conversation, we're going to be talking about athlete life, stigma, body image, and wellness with Victoria Garrick. And I'm really excited about this conversation. I've been excited and looking forward to hosting her for quite a while, just because of who she is, the influence she has, and the way that she really brings her whole self and talks to in so many authentic ways in so many spaces and has really, I think, transformed aspects of culture, especially among athletes. So by way of introduction, did want to go ahead and give you all a feel for who Victoria is. She is a former Division I volleyball player, a TED Talk speaker, and a mental health and body image advocate. She was a four-year starter at USC, won a Pac-12 championship with her team while she was there, and impressively finished her career with the top five most digs in program history. Um, in 2017, she also gave a TED Talk entitled The Hidden Opponent, where she described her battles and overcoming of depression and anxiety. And that talk itself has been viewed over 380,000 times. So really speaking to the timeliness of that talk and her influence. She has a really large social media following, which I mentioned with over 1 million followers across social media platforms. She has a weekly podcast called Real Pod, and also started a, pro- a nonprofit called The Hidden Opponent, where she, through that foundation, has been traveling around the country, really talking about mental health conversations and ways to destigmatize and really increase awareness. So I'm honored, thrilled, and grateful to welcome Victoria Garrett to the Addy Hour. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it and excited to chat with you today. Excellent. I'm excited as well. And I will say, I mean, I've alluded to this already, but you do have a lot of energy in your conversation. So my job today will be to keep up with you in some ways. (laughs) (laughs) You're actually catching me on like, I don't know if I would, I I don't want to call it an off day because I don't want to like label, you know, you're going to love all this. I've done so much therapy. I'm like, I don't want (laughs) to label it. I don't want to judge it. I'm just going to experience what's Mm -hmm. going on. But it definitely feels like an off day for me. I feel like I'm stuck between I'm proud of myself and I need to do more and work harder. Mm. So I'm in that limbo right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think I really appreciate you just sharing that honestly, too, because that's just part of the journey I think we're all on. And too many times we're not honest about that. You know, when we come on programs like this, we kind of get into our performance mode which I imagine, I know for me, it's easy to do. I imagine for someone like you, that could be easy to do just based on uh, being an athlete. So definitely appreciate that, that level of candor and honesty. Yeah. And I prefer to not be in like quote unquote performance mode. And I know what you mean. You know, mm-hmm. it's if I've had a question asked to me a hundred times, I just go on autopilot and I give the answer. Um, but that doesn't always feel like my choice. You know, it always feels like it's up to the asker or whoever I'm speaking with, like, I don't know what do they want Mm. from me. And it's actually made me reflect on how I interview people as well on my podcast, because I'll find like some people I'll interview and I know exactly what story I want them to tell. Like Mm. I've watched their players tribune this or their ESPN that. And I'm like, I want them to just re reiterate that on my show. Right. And then I think, gosh, are they then sitting there feeling the way I do sometimes where yeah. I'm like regurgitating a story that I've told before. Yeah. So it's my reminder to, to sit down with guests and be like, what do you want to talk about today? <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's so important. I think and it's a fine line to walk too. Cause like you said, I mean, the fact that you want them to tell that story, I assume it's because you want that your you want your audience to hear that story. It's going to connect with them. But at the same time, you want to be kind of caring for your guests too, to kind of help right. them really be their authentic selves and share in a way that feels meaningful to them. So Definitely. Yeah, def- definitely a, a journey that we're walking on and, and figuring out as we go. But I mean, to be honest, I feel like you've done such a great job of that in so many different ways. I mean, just listening to some of the conversations that you've held online um, and the way that your audience engages is really reflective of how much they appreciate just your level of authenticity. Thanks. Yeah, I really feel like that's been a priority of mine or mm-hmm. like an unwavering goal is mm-hmm. I never want my accounts to feel preachy or mm-hmm. like know all. Mm-hmm. And I think there are people who serve that purpose. Like, I don't know, a Tony Robbins isn't mm-hmm. going to post about having a hard day. He's always going to come with the like, and here's how you handle it. And here's the wisdom. And here's the, the three steps mm-hmm. to whatever. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'm just like, Hey, it's a bad day, period. I yeah. don't, I don't want to fix it today. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't know how. And I think that's given me a lot of flexibility and what people expect from me and, and 
lets me use my platforms authentically because Mm -hmm. I don't feel pressure to always have the answer. Yeah. Um, which is nice because I don't always have the answer. Exactly. And I I think that's why people are connecting with you because they can relate in that, in that space too. If someone's going through that same place, they can feel like, okay, here, well, here's someone that I can just listen to and engage with through this medium that knows kind of can feel where I'm at and really know what I'm going through because they're being honest about what they're going through. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of power in that. Um, and then, you know, it gives you space as I'm sure, you know, kind of sh- share the victories and the joys and the challenges along the way. And just, I think is really, really important for all of us as a society. So. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Now on that note, I think I also just want to, I mentioned to you, you know, before we jumped in, just wanted to kind of check in with you as well. I know you mentioned already, this is a not an off day, not an on day, somewhere in between. But I mean, I'm actually just curious because I mean, I think in so many ways, all of us as a society, we're still going through so much. I mean, things are starting to get back to quote unquote normal or this new normal, whatever that is. I mean, restaurants are opening up again. Um, for me as an NBA fan, it's nice to see people in the stands. You know, it's a different level of energy with the games. Uh, they're going on just, you know, being a college professor, you know, having students coming back and things like that. But then at the same time, and we just hit some grim statistics because we just hit 600,000 COVID related deaths in the U S we still have all the challenges that are going on around social injustice. There's still shootings that are happening all over the country. So it, in some ways it feels, I mean, just personally disorienting. It's like, Oh, there's this excitement, but there's also these challenges. There's also personal things we walk through. So I just, I actually just wanted to start there and see how you're doing in the midst of all these mixed things that are happening societally these days and even in your own life. Yeah, it's it's a difficult balancing act. I think some days I am super tuned in to the darkness mm. of the world mm. and then other days I'm not. But then the days that I'm not, I'm like, I have the privilege to not mm-hmm. be floating in the darkness today and to turn it off and yeah. others don't. And so it's, it's tough, you know, and then at the same time, everyone, you want to validate your own emotions and your own experiences. Mm. But in a time like this, how can you not compare and have perspective to who has it worse than you? Um, or, or what could have happened to your family or your loved ones this year that didn't, or maybe it did. Mm. So yeah, it's a lot. And I think with my mental health, I like to, get to the root of things. I like to uncover, you know, why is something triggering for me or why am I anxious? And I think I've struggled with accepting that I'm not going to have an answer every single day. You know, we've been through so much that this is like a whole new, for lack of a better term, like guinea pig, or like, this is an experience that the world hasn't had before. Like psychologists haven't seen before, you know, we're all figuring out what's going on, why we're not as motivated or why, you know, something's happening to us. And so I think today is one of those days for me where I'm trying not to judge or label how I feel, but I Mm -hmm. definitely feel anxious today. And I definitely feel like I'm running, but I'm not getting anywhere. Mm. Yeah. How do you feel? That makes a lot of sense. I think I'm with you in a lot of ways too. I mean, one thing that I've shared on this podcast before is just the way that the pandemic has normalized anxiety in a way that we didn't have before because of all the unknown and that, you know, being kind of a root of some of the challenges with anxiety when you can't predict what's coming next and don't feel like you have control. And just the fact that we've been going through a pandemic that we can't predict, I think has leveled the playing field. So I think similar to you, I have tried just in my own life to pay more attention to what's causing those feelings. Um, But even for me personally, I would say sometimes that processing is slow and it's been slower in the pandemic. So in some ways, I'd say today, it just feels mixed. So there are things that I'm trying to be excited about, but I'm also sobered at the same time. But then I want to kind of pace myself. Do I want to dig into every single piece of news that's out there right now about some of the tragedies that are happening? No. Do I want to totally ignore them? No. So in some ways, it's just almost kind of choosing when I have time to kind of engage in those, but not being oblivious to them at the same time. Um, But also some of it, I would say, is just giving myself kind of grace along the way to say yeah. that, okay, things are going to be off sometimes. I'm not going to be able to figure out the root cause of it like I would normally want to. Maybe take a pause and kind of come back to that. So I say today, I'm, I don't know if I call it an on day. I'd say it's a fine, the day is fine. <laughs> the, the fact that we're doing this podcast also helps, to be honest, if I'm being honest with my listeners as well, because that's something that I look forward to 
when we're doing these recordings and I gain so much from just hearing our guests like you just share about their experiences and really encourage others. So it's a mixture to be completely honest. It's a mixture of kind of all those things all together, but this is definitely one of the highlights. I think that in my own way, unintentionally, I'm using these podcasts to kind of elevate my own um, mood in some ways on a day-to-day basis. And it just gives me hope to be completely yeah, honest. I connect to that too. You know, having a deep conversation can change the trajectory of your day. You know, mm-hmm. there's certain times I sit down and I have a conversation and like, I leave it a completely different mood, like so inspired, so motivated or Mm -hmm. comforted or whatnot. And so I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, Just to be like completely present and go wherever our conversation may. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hundred percent with you on that. And I think it really speaks to that level of community too. I mean, obviously community looks very different these days than it has in the past. And there's all these conversations and arguments about, can you still have that community by zoom? Do you have to be in person? And there's valid pieces to all that, but I think there's still space for kind of deep authenticity that doesn't have to always happen in person. I mean, people have been doing that through phone calls, through text. And so it really, I think in some ways it's given us opportunities to really dig into that in another way. Um, for me personally, not to get too tangential, um, I've seen that even throughout COVID, I have family that's spread out all over the world. Um, so the gatherings we've been able to have at holidays, we wouldn't have had another time just being able to connect with people in ways and family members that we wouldn't have had before. Grant, it still takes a level of us being willing to go to that place of authenticity when we get on these Zoom calls and things like that. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. Yeah. The weird thing though about Zoom or FaceTime or whatnot is you feel so connected and then the minute it's end or computer shuts, you're alone again in your yeah. house or your apartment. Yeah. And that I think is really weird. Um And also there's an element of, I don't know, just sensing someone's aura or Mm -hmm. their energy. Mm -hmm. And I miss that, Mm -hmm. you know, it's possible to have conversations and go deep without that, but I don't know, awkward silences. I weirdly miss those. I, I miss feeling tension or, or, or whatnot. And that's stuff I'm excited for as the world opens back up. Mm. Um, but I think it has certainly taught us a lot about connection. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great perspective. I mean, that you're highlighting kind of both sides of the coin too, because I've definitely even sensed that as I've had get togethers outside with students, you know, over the semester, it's just a different level of energy that comes there. And it's almost like that, just that one hour meeting kind of changed, like you said, the trajectory of everyone's day. There was just a different pep in people's step. I know I'm sounding like I'm 50 years old right now, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but you know, just what that, what that did to, to really change people's attitude during the day, just that in-person connection. Um, it's funny you mentioned the awkwardness, the silent awkwardness, because those pieces are definitely there too, but even in a way those were energizing too. So yeah, there's a lot yeah. of learning. Yeah, definitely. I feel like learning so much and mm-hmm. there's weirdly, like, obviously I don't, wish that the past year, like, I don't wish that it happened to our mm-hmm. world, but if I'm trying to find a silver lining and like, accept that this did happen and this mm-hmm. is what it is, there are so many things that I think I've learned mm-hmm. and ways I've grown. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I would have had those realizations or that time or those family mm-hmm. connections or family issues addressed, you know, mm-hmm. had there not been such silence, panic, and claustrophobia at one time, you know? Yeah. So, so I'm definitely leaving like the pandemic. I literally got a coffee today without a mask for the first time. It was so weird. I felt like, <laughs> you know, that was, the, that was big for me. Um, I definitely feel like there's so much I learned throughout mm-hmm. this time. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really encouraging for me to hear too. And I think even for our audience, because in a lot of ways, just everything you've done over the last few years you've been at such a high level of sharing your story so openly and honestly. I think people are getting a lot of that from you, but to even hear that you're still learning in the process, I think is just really beneficial for people to be able to hear as well, to know that even someone like you who's had such a journey and has learned so much, there's always more to learn. And it's not like this is not a one-time thing that just ended in a sense. And that's the end of the story. Definitely. And that's something that I have to remind myself Mm -hmm. of Like I had an instance, I gave a keynote Mm -hmm. virtually, but Mm -hmm. to the University of Wisconsin Mm -hmm. um, on mental health and body image Mm -hmm. and these issues. And Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's a big school for me. Like that's a power five conference mm-hmm. school. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm it's Wisconsin. And then I'm, I'm so the whole few days before and the day of, like, I just had such imposter syndrome. I was like, I mean, and a whole other conversation is giving a keynote virtually. I mean, yeah. it's, it's already a lose. Like, you know, no one's showing up to zoom prepared to be fully engaged for 45 minutes. Whereas maybe when they walk into an auditorium, like they're like, okay, I'll invest my emotions. I'll open my heart. It's so that's weird. And then I'm not just like presenting a math presentation. I'm like opening up my heart, which is even harder because I'm like, hello, is anyone on the other side of the yeah. screen? <laughs> um, you see people fidgeting, turning off their cameras is really difficult. Yeah. So, so that's an element. And then I'm, I have that imposter syndrome of like, what if they don't like what I have to say? What if I don't touch someone? What if I don't move them? What if I, you know, I, I lose sight. And then I, I had like a last minute therapy session that day. Like yeah. I happened to be able to get squeezed in by my yeah. therapist And, um, she said to me, but isn't that what you speak about (laughs) this right now? Like, why do you feel like you have to pretend this isn't happening? Mm -hmm. You know, why don't you like open up your keynote in your intro with like, guess where I was at one o'clock today, Mm -hmm. like therapy. And so, you know, I, after they read my introduction, I was like, I got to admit today, it feels really weird to hear my intro because I cringe at like the accomplishments and the whatnot, because I still don't feel like good enough that I, I even did things, you know? And, and then it just really made me feel lighter continuing yeah. with the presentation because my big fear that I'm not good enough and I'm an imposter. Well, guess what? I told everyone in the first two minutes. Yeah. And I also think I did gain some respect because they were like, Whoa, is this, this is TMI from this lady. What else does she have to say? <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, I think, you know, going back to how we even got here in the first place is I feel very okay in not having the answers. And I'm always trying to learn, but I definitely have to remind the people who follow me of that all the time, because they do come to me as if I have all the answers or that I'm totally healthy and done with depression and body image issues, Mm -hmm. or there's an expectation of like, I'm always happy. I'm always on top of my anxiety and my sadness and my, and it's just not the case. And so yeah. I feel like I'm always saying back, hi, I'm, I'm definitely, I know some stuff, mm. but I'm still as lost as you. Yeah. yeah. I think that goes a long way. I imagine, I imagine that folks can really resonate with that, especially when they're walking through it at the same time. Um, and it's just, it's just good to hear the yeah. not good in the sense that like, oh, this is great, but good in the sense that it's authentic and it empowers other people too. Um, just everything you're going through. So I'm also, you know, there may be a few members of our audience who don't know your story too. So I'd be curious if you could just share with them, especially along this journey and and the way that you just even talked about the imposter syndrome, that's definitely real and so big at times. Um, I've had similar situations where I've shared my story as a black neuroscientist with imposter syndrome in a Zoom setting to, you know, hundreds of virtual people that can't see. So definitely relate to you on that aspect. But like with all of that, how did you even get to this place of wanting to share your story, especially because it was already hard and with all those challenges there, how how did you move into the space of saying, okay, well, I'm going to take this imposter stream. I'm still going to talk about it. What gave you that that strength? So just to stop myself from speaking for the next hour, nonstop, (laughs) I'll give you like the elevator pitch of my, my story. Um, I essentially went to USC to play volleyball And on paper, you know, that was everything I'd worked, wanted out of high school, you know, Mm -hmm. Pac-12, great team, great school academics, like had friends, like this is what I was supposed to do. Like Mm -hmm. I'm a successful teenager. Um, But then, you know, I started to realize that no matter how many boxes you check off in life, you know, you're, that's not the answer to happiness, fulfillment, meaning, purpose, all those important things that we really need. And I, it took me a while to learn that, but my freshman year, you know, I felt so much pressure. It's like, I finally made it to the cl- to cloud nine and then it was okay. Well, let's survive at cloud nine. And we were number one team in the country, national player of the year is on the court with me to win the first 22 games. I'm adjusting to the college um, academic level. I'm always missing class. I'm on planes every other week. I mean, there was just a whole new lifestyle mm-hmm. and so much demand that I was not prepared for Mm. and that I did not know how to handle. Mm. And so as a result, I developed performance anxiety. 
um, intertwined with some binge eating as coping. Mm -hmm. Um, and then going through that for two years, I didn't, Oh, sorry, going for that, for those two things for one year, I didn't number, I didn't know what was happening to me. You know, I was like, why am I crying before games? Why am I so nervous to play? Why is my heart racing? I didn't even know performance anxiety was a thing. I thought people had social anxiety. I really didn't understand the scope. And I was like, I talk to people, I make friends. Like, I don't have that. So I was like, what's happening to me. There was also that look at me now I'm going off on my hour rant. I'm almost done. Um, (laughs) I'm like, I'm like, there's also this, um, pressure, uh, and this idea of what an athlete is a D one athlete, a USC, your Pac-12 champions, you know, you don't have weakness. You get the job done. You don't make excuses. You figure it out. So I also felt really, um, insecure and not valid in the anxiety I was facing and the body image issues. And then come my sophomore year, I mean, fell, hit that wall. And that was depression for me. And so having gone, so that was kind of how those things manifested. Right, right. Um, but then it was my sophomore year when I finally was seeing a therapist, you know, I'd really hit that place of like, it's either continue into the darkness, which at this point I'm terrified about, mm-hmm. or have that conversation and wave my white flag and surrender, which is what mm-hmm. I thought I was doing at the time. Um, and then in getting help and starting to get better and, and getting on meds and starting to understand, Oh, this is what's going on. This is why it happened. This is how you can make it better. Like th- this, there you're normal. There's mm-hmm. solutions. There's, there's ways to go about this. That's when that next element of like, whoa, well then why was I so caught off guard? Why wasn't I aware of this? Why didn't I know it was okay? And then that's really what sparked my desire to share Mm -hmm. was truly so that no other athlete had to go through what I did, you know, that we could say something Mm -hmm. before it happened. Um, and you know, that confidence didn't come out of nowhere. I, uh, was a journalism major. I loved storytelling. I loved being Mm. in front of cameras. So once I understood and came to terms with what had happened to me and accepted it, then the normal personality that I had kicked in of like, well, let's talk about this. Let's bring attention to it. Um, so then I delivered that Ted talk, which it's a whole nother story, but it wasn't as easy as I just made it sound. Um, and then that, from that point on was really finding my voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. In so many ways. I mean, it sounds like there was an awakening in that sense. And it's not, I mean, it sounds like part of that was a healthy fear too, of where things could go and that you just decided you didn't want to be. Yeah. In that place. Yeah. You know, I think the thing that I can always come back to is my young life. Mm. Like as a teenager, I never understood why people would kill themselves. Mm. I didn't get it. It was mm. like, but life is so great. Why wouldn't mm. you want to live? Mm. Why wouldn't I want to be alive? And then it was my sophomore year. I remember thinking to myself, oh, now I know. Mm-hmm. Now I know why people don't want to be here and mm-hmm. they don't want to live. And that was my, whoa, Yeah, like we are somewhere else now. Yeah. And you know, that was, was for me that like awareness Mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, I've tried to deal with this myself and it's only gotten worse. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course now I'm at a place where like, yes, I have sympathy and so much compassion Mm -hmm. and love for those who, who are unable to keep living, Mm -hmm. but I don't feel that way anymore, which is why I'm so passionate about like pulling someone out of those depths because I've been in the depths and I'm out of them. And so I want people to know you can escape those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So important that realization, I think that goes a long way. You know, obviously as we talk about a lot of times, the fact that people are just trying to escape the pain because they can't figure out how to deal with it. So I think the fact that you have that awareness and can kind of meet people there. And then also that the fact that you're talking about all the things that you wish you had been aware of beforehand, because you just thought things were normal. You didn't know necessarily what was going on at the time. And so the fact that you're kind of empowering others to tackle things head on early on, I think is so important. I'm curious, even if, you know, if you're willing to elaborate more just in terms of, cause you know, student athletes who may be listening in, like, what is, how do you find that line between having a high level of performance and expectation, but then knowing when to pull back? Cause as I've heard you talk about lots of times, you know, as an athlete, there is that fine line of, there is someone else that's ready to replace you if you kind of slip in your performance or if there's that, that, 
that window. So, I mean, that's to me, that doesn't sound like an easy decision to make. And I, ex I expect that extends beyond sports as well. I mean, people who are in intense work environments, intense academic settings, um, even to take the scope a little bit further, I'm thinking about some of the things we talked about that this podcast in terms of minorities who are in situations where they're the only one. There's this huge weight to kind of represent kind of a bigger culture than yourself and all those tensions. I'm just curious, you know, in your own experience, how, how do you, how do you suggest that people kind of figure out that, that line about when to yeah. seek help? Yeah, it's a great question. I have a, a few things I'll share on that. Mm -hmm. um, I will preface this by saying, I'll speak from the perspective of a competitive student athlete mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's my experience. Yeah. And I never want to act like I understood even the surface of the struggles, you know, a minority or someone without white privilege might be experiencing. So mm -hmm. recognize that and don't want to even act like I could elaborate on answering that question, but to the experiences of like a high performing student athlete mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. high performing academic student. Um, what I would say is, you know, the way that sports culture, uh, teaches you to work hard and like the way they communicate work ethic is it's the grind. It's you mm -hmm. always go one more. You mm -hmm. always push harder. Mm -hmm. You do the best don't rest, you know, un unless this is one of the most absurd quotes that used to motivate me, unless you puke, faint or die, yeah, keep right. going. <laughs> I mean, that is something yeah. that I had on my locker. Like that is something yep. athletes use. Yep. And, and it's also praised, you know, um, by like the goats, which I can also get into later um, because Kobe Bryant actually has expressed different thoughts on this, you know, things get misconstrued. But mm. um, first thing I'd say is the, the way that it's communicated to us is go, 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 never stop. And any excuses or pullback is weakness. So that's the first problem is like, we're being taught the wrong thing. It's mm -hmm. an impossible standard. It doesn't work. The second piece that I'd actually be curious, your thoughts on this. Um, and I learned this from one of my, uh, favorite sports psychologists, Dr. Michael Gervais, mm -hmm. but there's a difference between mental health and mental toughness. Mm -hmm. And the line often gets very blurry. Um, and the difference is not communicated to athletes nor to coaches. Coaches, most of the time, are the ones who ask this question because they don't understand, like, how do I know when my player is depressed or when he's just not trying mm -hmm. um, or she's just not doing this? So mental health is obviously like your general state of mind, your general well-being. Like, let's imagine that is the base. If you think of physical health, ironically, it's easy to understand. You know, someone physically healthy, then mental toughness is something that can be trained. It's a mm -hmm. skill. It's with reps, with time, with putting yourself in the trenches, with overcoming adversity time and time again, you get tougher mentally. Um, however, the way they relate to like peak performance and being an elite athlete or an elite performer in any capacity is, you know, mental health is the foundation. Um, and then mental toughness is the bridge mm. to peak performance, mm -hmm. sustainable peak performance. Yeah. So Athletes have to understand, you know, is, am I working at my base or am I building my bridge right now? Um, and that's something that I think each person has to learn for themselves and they have to be willing to identify that. Mm -hmm. um, to give an example, my freshman year, I started and I played, but I wasn't in the position I wanted. I was like in a second string role, but mm -hmm. not the first string role. And I remember similar to that mentality. I was like, okay, when she's in the gym, I'm in the gym. If she's passing, I'm passing. If she goes, I go like, I will outwork you. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, all of my choices and actions were based on outworking her, not actually focusing on what was best for me. Mm -hmm. And so I got anxious. I overworked myself. I wasn't listening to my body, listening to my training. Then come my senior year, I'm in that first string position. I've done all this work. And what do you know, that girl behind me, she's staying extra. She's doing this and that. And I don't know if it was, you know, motivated by me. She could have just been doing it. Yeah. But I, I felt that in me. Of, oh my gosh, you know, my backup is doing these things. Um, should I stay? And I was like, you know what? No, I gave my all for three hours. I feel like I had a good practice. And I think it's more beneficial for me to call it a day, grab my water, shower, and go eat dinner with my roommate because I put my work in. I feel good about that. Yeah. You know, it has to be based on you. Yeah. And another thing that comes to mind, and you mentioned this in the question was, 
this idea of like holding back. And one of my favorite quotes from Kobe Bryant's um, recent novel, Geese Are Never Swans, Mm -hmm. is it takes more strength to hold back Mm -hmm. than it does to push. The easy thing is to go one. Yeah. The easy thing is to go one more, to do what coach says. The easy thing is to buy in. The harder thing is to speak up for yourself. Mm -hmm. The harder thing is to say, I don't have this in me. I'm working at e-fuel and I've been there for two days now. I need to rest. I need recovery. So lots of points there um, in, in, in an answer to your question. I would invite everyone to explore. Are you working with your mental health? Is this an issue of mental toughness? And can you play with that and use your experiences to help guide you to when you're making the right call? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's so helpful. I mean, you covered a lot of ground there. I think it's all all great, especially that distinction between the toughness versus the mental health. I mean, to expand that a little bit, uh, I mean, that's something I think we talk a lot about within the field. So with me as a basic neuroscientist, you know, I have some clinical shadowing that I've done as well. And one of the things that we often talk about is just if that baseline has shifted. And you mentioned that when you're talking about your journey as well. So were there are there days or weeks on end where people are different than they were before? Are they is there, has their mood kind of shifted for long periods of time, even, you know, on the playing field, on the court, et cetera, like has that baseline really just adjusted completely where there's not as much motivation to get up each day to kind of stay on the grind versus is it a matter of mental toughness, which is kind of more of an acute or short-term situational type of thing. So I think it's really helpful how you've kind of highlighted those pieces as well, um, because I think that's yeah. part of the nuance. And really, if people, if people can sense that the baseline has shifted, like you talked about, that's a whole nother scenario than talking about the mental toughness of each situation. And like you said, you can kind of build and practice that mental toughness. So I know that's a framework that people have used as well, but just in terms of when we're talking to just general population, that's often something that we mentioned, just looking for those differences and kind of overall demeanor and mood or a shift from kind of what looked to be people's normal mode beforehand. Yeah. And I'm curious your thoughts on this because because it's something I've been thinking about. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I have like a concrete take on it, mm-hmm. but it's great that anxiety, depression, all these things are being normalized. Mm-hmm. However, sometimes I wonder if someone experiences nervousness mm-hmm. and says I have anxiety mm-hmm. or experiences sadness and says I'm depressed. Mm-hmm. And it's tough because if someone says they're anxious or depressed, you don't want to question that. You want to validate that and take their word for it. That's so important. However, are we getting desensitized to what like the actual mental illnesses are and the, what the concrete diagnosable mental health issues are? Um, and as a result, are some of the people who are just nervous mm-hmm. or just sad kind of maybe giving up too soon on the fact mm-hmm. that they could they could do some work there to, to get back to a place they want to be. I almost think people are so um, focused on being happy all the mm-hmm, time mm-hmm. that the minute an emotion comes, that's not happiness. We want to label it as mm-hmm. something that maybe it's not yet. Yeah. And I, I know that that's like uh, controversial to say, I just think it's an important yeah. component. Yeah. No, I think it's a really good question. I mean, I'll, I'll be a little bit speculative, in that sense as well, but I think you're on to something as well. Um, So, I mean, from a clinical standpoint, whenever people are, you know, in a clinical situation with clinical anxiety, you know, generalized anxiety disorder or depression, kind of one of the hallmarks within therapy is not to avoid the anxiety uh, because that just lets it sit. So there's, you know, there's lots of ways that psychologists kind of walk people through that to kind of, you you can do exposure therapy to kind of walk up to things over time and kind of deal with it. But the reason I bring that up is I think it ties into what you're mentioning as well when people are talking about times of being anxious or feeling sad. And so there's a line there, and this is a speculative part, there's a line to walk where you don't want people who are feeling that to just avoid it because that in itself is not necessarily healthy. Because in some ways, you know, some aspects of anxiety are good for us. It it kind of helps us gear up. So, you know, from a classroom setting, people often talk about, you know, if you're getting a little bit anxious about a test, that's probably good. It will probably encourage you to study and not just wing it. So there, there's a ramping of it kind of forcing you to take that seriously. Or if someone's giving a talk in front of a hundred thousand people, there's probably going to be some anxiety, but that's not necessarily bad. It can kind of help them elevate their performance. 
Um, right. So, you know, that can come in with sports environments as well. But I do think there is a line to walk. And I don't know if I have a clear answer for you in terms of making sure that people are empowered to still move through those things. So like you said, you have to validate it. You don't want to be dismissive of it because you don't know the level of depth that it is. But at the same time, you don't want people to be, and maybe this is where you're going with your question, to be hampered by that. Or Yeah, sometimes I think mental health issues or mental illness or eating disorders can become glamorized. Mm. And you know, you see people wanting to have that issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like I said, I don't have a, it's something I've noticed and I don't have like a take on it. Mm Um, I just think it's worth thinking about Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's important to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think that comes down to some of the awareness that you talked about too, so that people have a clear sense of what's just, normal isn't the best word to use, but what's a normal level of anxiety to expect in the situation versus what is something that's really much more severe. And so one example I've paid sometimes is in terms of Uh, worry versus anxiety. Worry is a little bit more kind of acute in this situation. So if someone's worried about a test, it'll kind of be localized to that experience. If they're worried about their performance with their boss, it'll be localized to that specific interaction with their boss. When they get to more anxiety, it becomes much more generalizable. So every time they walk to a classroom setting, if they start to feel any of those like physical sensations that are associated with anxiety or overwhelmed, that's kind of more of a something that might touch on some of those clinical pieces. So it kind of depends on the expansion of it. And so I think in some ways it can be helpful, you know, when people are bringing it up to kind of, if people are willing to dive in a little bit and talk through what that experience is like, um, and I think that can kind of help people distinguish. And again, it kind of depends on how long it's lasting and how much it's different from the norm. But granted, I mean, you know, I'm saying all that, but there is also... There are challenges with the way that we diagnose things as well. So I have to, you know, I have to put that um, out. Is, and we've talked about that ac- across cultures as well. How were those yeah. even designed and were they applied to one group versus do they take into account what different people experiences in different cultures? So true. And like now to flip the switch and maybe be the, the, per- the people I'm talking about is mm-hmm. with eating disorders, mm. there's such a specific mm. clinical threshold mm that you need to like, uh, meet to have that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, and so there's that, that's one example, specific example. Mm -hmm. And then there's obviously something sad I've been learning is like, not every professional licensed professional is, is necessarily on their game, like Mm -hmm. necessarily knows what they're talking about, which is Mm -hmm. crazy. Like how can someone be a licensed mental health professional and, and not be, like not be not necessarily good at what they're doing, but miss things or mm-hmm. overdiagnose, things, mm-hmm. you know, whatnot. So you're right. There's totally a, uh, a flaw in the system there as well as people might not be getting the diagnosis that, that they need, or that's right for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I certainly felt that way with, uh, my eating disorder, mm-hmm. because I know I had a binge eating disorder. Mm-hmm. I would not call what happened to me less than that, mm-hmm. but if I look up the wrong site or mm-hmm. the wrong this, that, there's like one thing I don't meet, you know? And of course I had a, uh, one of our dietitians at SC, you know, when we met, she was the one that like diagnosed and confirmed mm-hmm. this for me, but I always still felt a little insecure about it, but I've come into my own of like, no, I know this is what was wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And so then once again, there's, there's that other side of the conversation is people know what they're going through. And it's always hard to get maybe an, an external person to validate that and fully understand what their needs might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think one thing that can be helpful there, well, a couple of things, actually. I mean, you're right, unfortunately, in the sense that not everyone is on their A game when it comes to just dealing with mental health. And so there, unfortunately, has to be some level of discernment on people who are looking for help, which is unfortunate because it's backwards. It shouldn't be that way. But sometimes it might mean going through two or three people until you find the right match. And again, just knowing people, you know, just figure out if people are doing things appropriately. That's a lot of, and again, it's a lot of unnecessary weight on the person who's looking. Right. Thing that we often say is like, are people actually willing to listen to your story when you come in? Because you are the expert on your life and you're sharing that with someone. Are they listening to your story and trying to figure out where you're at? Or are they just taking a specific thing and kind of dumping that on you? a specific diagnosis, a specific framework and dumping that on you, which again gets to the thing that you talked about before of, are they 
uh, aware or, or cognizant or equipped to really deal with the, the binge eating disorder if it's there. And we talked about that. Again, I, you know, I keep kind of harping back to the theme of the podcast, but we've talked a lot about just cultural competency, competency too. If people are able to think about where different people come from, I think this extends even, you know, the things athletes may be going through, people from different cultures and listening to those stories or kind of just dumping a specific diagnosis on people. So I think when there are those who kind of have that balance of their expertise and listening to where people are coming from, I think it goes a long way. Yeah, that's all fascinating. Are there, are there ways that, because there's, I mean, there's so many good things that we're pulling out here. This could probably be a three hour conversation, but are there ways that you've tried to even incorporate some of these concepts in your talks or online, in your podcasts, on YouTube to really empower people? Because I mean, the questions that you're wrestling through, the questions that we're talking through, I think people can clearly tell from the conversation, even we don't have all the answers. So how do you take that and try to help other people even get to a place of knowing where to start? I think I've had to get clear on what my purpose is and what value I can bring. And, you know, I'm not a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to be hosting one-on-one sessions with athletes acting Mm -hmm. like I can solve their problems because Mm -hmm. I can't. But I think what my value add is, is destigmatizing the issue for people who are in similar, highly touted roles, Mm -hmm. positions, Mm -hmm. teams, like I, like I was. So I think there's that element. I think there's, um, normalizing the many concerns and challenges and insecurities and struggles that people in those situations are facing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's also relating and being able to speak on that level of like, I'm a teammate or I am like a friend, you know, Mm -hmm. oftentimes when I come in to speak, there's just a totally different connection Mm -hmm. because I, it's almost like street cred. It's like, Mm -hmm. I've, I've been in their shoes. Exactly. Like I, I know what they're going through where sometimes when someone tries to relate to you and they, they don't get it, it's just, I, I often have, we'll, we'll have literally like the sports psychologist at the school be like, gosh, like they're listening to you, but say the same thing I've said, but only because you're like the same age as them and you yeah. played it as yeah. like you get it yep. because yep. when it's coming from an adult or someone who's not close. So, so I think yep. that's also something unique is it's one thing for the, for even, I mean, a school is lucky to have an athletic director address mental health, but if yep. someone in that position addresses it, it mm-hmm. still won't hit the same as a peer. And I consider myself a peer. And I think that's one of my superpowers and in, yep. in that sense for this conversation. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Well, what are some of the pieces that you try? Because even as you're talking to other student athletes or coaches, are there specific tips that you have for folks in terms of like what to look out for? Um, because one of the things I've often wondered, you know, as you were going through everything, did you, did you think your teammates and friends, did they notice anything? Were there things that they could have said that would have been helpful? And if so, are there things you try and pass along to others? Yeah, you know, I would say um, talking. So if I'm sharing my story or or speaking or giving takeaways or whatever it is, I think most of the time with athletes, I like them to know that their their journey and their trajectory, while the details might be different than mine, like, Hey, I get it. And this is how it happened to me and how it might've happened to you. And, and you're not alone in that. And I think with coaches, it's more, this is the experience or this is how like the epitome of your number one ideal recruit, like the epitome of that for you, how they went off the rails or how they didn't become successful or how they struggled or suffered in some way. Because I like to think when I walked on USC's campus, I was everything a coach would want. Mm -hmm. Um, Not from like, and I'm not speaking about talent. I'm speaking about like coachability. I was Mm -hmm. eager to be there. I was a good Mm -hmm. teammate. I was energetic. I was positive. I was enthusiastic. Like all the intangibles you would want in a player. Like I really would back myself up and I I walked onto campus with those. Mm -hmm. How does that athlete become depressed? Mm -hmm. How does that athlete become anxious and not want to play anymore? And so that's the journey I try to take those coaches on because they sit in their office and they don't know how that happened. Or they say like, we know you guys are stressed, but no one's actually really said, yeah. And like, this is why we have the 6 a.m. this, 7 a.m. that, 8 a.m. And then I get home at seven, I got to watch film and then I 6 a.m. again. Like no one's really 
you know, that's the other thing from the coach's perspective is mm-hmm. I get to say what the player's afraid to say. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the value add there is like your players are thinking this and I'm, I don't care. You can't bench me. Yeah. So I'm going to explain, you know, what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so powerful. I mean, you're giving that voice and I think that goes such a long way. And it's actually wraps back into the point you made earlier too, about just everything with it, with COVID. I, I feel like, and I could be wrong, but there is, at least from a coaching standpoint, it seems like there has been a little bit more awareness of that. And again, I'm talking from the outside as a non-college athlete, but just things I've seen, I even remember, you know, I'm a Duke grad and think about Coach K giving the team a couple of weeks off instead of playing games because he said he was concerned for his players' mental health and just giving them a space. Um, so granted, this is from the outside, but I don't ever remember hearing any of those conversations beforehand. I mean, yeah. more so has kind of been the backlash. So I think it's great that you're there in a way, infiltrating is not the right word, but in a sense, I mean, you're, you're on the ground having those conversations, making sure it gets heard and hopefully in a way that penetrates and that people are able to kind of receive and incorporate. Right. And I think that's talking about, you know, the benefits from what's happened is the awareness and the inability to deny the legitimacy of mental health issues um, for so many different groups of people. So it's, I think that's been a, a, one of the, you know, positives, Mm -hmm. which is still so hard to say of all Mm -hmm. of this is like, you can't ignore mental health anymore. You know, the crisis is real. It was real. It's even worse now and we can't just ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so important. Hopefully that feels, uh, encouraging and validating the work that you've been doing for years already. I mean, I know that what you're doing is so impactful for so many people and just even some of the videos that you've, you've put online, the ways that people have responded to your work, I know it goes a long way. And I I assume it's spreading too. like each person that you touch is able to kind of share that with others around, around them as well. So definitely appreciate the work that you're doing. I feel like the time went really quickly. We could probably go on for quite a while. Uh, I'll be last words of, uh, advice or or wisdom that you want to share with the audience in terms of just the general audience and student athletes in particular? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I agree. It flew by. It was great speaking with you. Um, I just love to encourage, you know, any student athletes who are maybe looking for that community or looking for a place to have their story heard or for support can definitely check out uh, the hidden opponent, which is the nonprofit I founded. We have a really cool private Facebook group with over a thousand athletes, um, cool free events, you know, just a place where if you want to connect with other athletes who are having these conversations and, and feel supported to to definitely check that out. And that's just the hidden opponent.com or the hidden opponent on Instagram. Excellent. Well, definitely appreciate you sharing that. And again, appreciate the work that you're doing to really help so many folks and empower and help people kind of be uh, whole in that sense and really make sure that uh, mental health is at the forefront. And of course, thanks for jumping on the Addy Hour. Appreciate having you here. Thank you.